What a great juxtaposition with the hymn and, and that wonderful song of God's grace. Uh, our speaker this morning is someone I'm just thrilled to be able to introduce to you. Now, you know, introducers say things like that, but I really mean this. Uh, Edie Schultze is our new, our brand new Vice President of Student Life. And uh, how to describe this woman? She, uh, she's a consummate professional and the kind of person you want to live next door to you. Uh, someone you'd love to go for a walk with or uh, be instructed on what's the best course of action to take in difficult kind of institutional questions that she deals with uh, continually in her position. Uh, Edie is a lot of fun. Uh, she's very smart, and she loves Jesus Christ. And uh, she's a first-year administrator here at Westmont College. And so, Edie, we welcome you uh, to tell us a bit about yourself, your story, and we welcome you to Westmont College. Let's give Dr. Edie Schultze. Great. Father in heaven, thank you for this, uh, your servant. And Lord, you have equipped her. You have brought her to this moment. It's your good pleasure that she's with us. Lord, I pray she'll feel that pleasure as she speaks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, Westmont. It's really good to be here. It's good to be uh, on campus. It's good to be in chapel here this morning. And I consider it an honor and a privilege to talk with you about the subject I'm going to address this morning. You know we're in a series on resiliency and grit. And I'm going to talk to you as my friends because I want to tell you about a part of my life that was very challenging and really difficult. So I have two stories. Both are true. One is my story. And the other is a story of a historical event that happened in Hinckley, Minnesota. That story, the second one about, the, about uh, that event in Hinckley, serves as an illustration or a way of understanding what happened in my life. So we're going to start by listening to a little clip, watching a little clip from the Weather Channel and Mark Mancuso, who will explain what happened in Hinckley. Okay, you're probably asking, you're probably asking why, why am I telling you this story about the devastating fire in Hinckley, Minnesota. I used to live in Minnesota, and when I moved there in 2008 to start working at Bethel University, I wanted to learn about the state. So I went with a friend to the little town of Hinckley. It's about halfway between the Twin Cities and Duluth. Let me unpack what happened here, just so you catch the details. It was a pine logging area, lots of pine forests and trees, and what they did in those days, late 1890s, was they would strip the trees of their needles and let the needles lay on the ground. Now, some of the workers would burn the debris, but some would leave it there. Essentially, what you had was a gathering of dry pine needles, and over time, in some places, it was a, a foot thick. Okay, I don't have to tell you that that is a recipe for disaster in a fire zone. It was bad, there was bad practice that was happening in terms of the accumulation of this, this debris. So, uh, I call that dysfunction. And then there was a disturbance in the atmosphere. I'm not a meteorologist, don't know very much about this, but I do understand that when there's cold air up top and hot air down below, they call that a temperature inversion. And what happened was the cold air held the gases and the heat down so that when two of these fires connected and united their force, the flame came up like a tornado or a vortex bursting through the division between the hot air and the cold air, and then all of that cold air with oxygen swept in, and the fire took off. Firestorms normally don't happen in nature like that. They normally happen as a result of a nuclear bomb or some kind of devastating experience in war. But in this situation, it was, a, it was occurring because of this, these fires. So it swept north, devastated the town of Hinckley and five others, and as you heard, lots of people were killed. So we had this dysfunction in the atmosphere, we had this bad practice, this, dis, um, this disturbance in the atmosphere, this bad practice, this dysfunction, people, what people were doing, and there was this, this debris. Terrible situation. Now, I like illustrations, things that help me understand what's going on in my own life, stories like that, because when I think about the period of my life that was in the mid-1990s, uh, these three elements apply. Debris, dysfunction, and disturbance. 
In the mid-1990s, I was working at Wheaton College, had been there about eight years, and uh, I experienced what was classified as a clinical depression, a major depression. I was born into a family that had four kids, loving parents, godly people, raised in rural Canada. Mostly what we talked about was the weather, the farming, who's getting married, uh, who had babies. We didn't talk much about emotions. I remember when I was growing up, if I was angry with my sister or fighting with my brother, what would often happen is I was told, you go to your room, and when you can find your happy face, then you can come back out. I never saw my parents argue, so when it came to handling difficult emotions like sadness, anger, fear, frustration, I didn't have a very good preparation period. I love my parents. In fact, I was just with them this past weekend. Things are much better now. They are still loving, godly people, and we can talk about our emotions. In fact, I had a really nice conversation with my mom, and I asked her about things that are frustrating for her right now, and she was able to articulate it. And I was able to respond back to her and say, oh, mom, that's so hard. So we're much better now, but when I was growing up, we weren't very good at it. I'm a doer. I feel reward when someone says to me, you've done a great job or you've contributed well. I love it when what I, what I do is significant, when it's well received. I wasn't very much, I wasn't very good at relationships. In fact, it was a little ironic when I started working at Wheaton College as a residence director and I was, that was my main job, was to build relationships with people. I had to learn all of that. I had black and white thinking ways of thinking about my life and things around me. It was things were either right or wrong, bad or good, black or white. Very clear, it wasn't very, uh, wasn't very, uh, very well-developed way of thinking about life. Now, I was in my mid to late 30s in the 1990s. So where you are right now in your 18 to 23-year-old years, if you're thinking about these things, you're already way ahead of me and probably way ahead of a lot of people who are in my generation. We didn't work very hard when I was growing up at helping other people understand how they were wired, how God made them. We work pretty hard at that here. So I would say pay attention to that, but for me, it was kind of a void, it was kind of a gap. This was my debris, my stack of pine needles. I wasn't very good at emotions, relationships, didn't know how to talk about my life, didn't understand who I was and how I was wired. Enter the dysfunction. In the mid-1990s, I worked with a coworker who over the course of eight or nine years, as I look back on it now, I describe it as, a, as there was a dismantling of my sense of self. Whatever sense of self that I had was dismantled within this relationship. Expectations were not clear, it was frustrating week to week to not be able to do something that was satisfactory. Instructions were erratic. I tried the best I could to succeed in the ways that I knew. I was a doer, I wanted to succeed, I wanted to do something right. When that didn't work, when I wasn't successful at that, I wanted to do something about it to fix it. I was unable to, and it left me feeling inadequate, discouraged, diminished, questioning my competence, and therefore my value. That was a dysfunctional relationship. I had another dysfunctional relationship, and it was codependent. Now what that means is that I did anything I could to be wanted and to belong, to feel loved, to stay in this relationship. I made a lot of bad choices, a lot of sacrifices of myself in order to be in this relationship. I did anything I could to maintain close connection. It started to become really difficult to tell where I stopped and this other person started. Our lives were so enmeshed. These were the burning fires of dysfunction against, un, against the debris that had gathered from my past. And then there was a disturbance in the system. Something unusual happened. In the fire situation in Hinkley, they call it a temperature inversion. Here, things, a uh, couple things in particular. One, I had my integrity questioned. Somebody questioned that what I said I would do I didn't do, and that's another story for another time. 
But I had, I, I had actually done what I said I would do, but my, my integrity was questioned. That was new for me. I was a doer. I kept my word. When I signed my name to something, I meant it, and I followed through. So when someone questioned me about that, there was a disturbance in the system. It was unusual. Something inverted happened. I was bypassed for a job opportunity. That had never happened to me before. I had not failed like that caught me off guard. I didn't know what to do with that. I was unpredictable day to day. People who worked with me would actually check with each other and say, is today a good day to talk to Edie? Not today. Sometimes they would say, today is an OK day. This was going on around me, and I didn't know it was happening. So debris, dysfunction, and disturbance, and the result was these things collided into a major depression. At the center of it, I would say that I, I experienced a loss of dignity. I didn't think I was valued. I didn't know who I was. I wanted to be loved just because. And when that didn't happen, I lost dignity. That led to a loss of hope. And it looked like, in my life, things like this. I lacked interest in things that typically were important to me. I had trouble sleeping. I was tired every day. I felt worthless. I felt guilty. I had trouble concentrating and making decisions. And in a job like mine, working as a director of residence life at Wheaton College, it was a problem. I had thoughts of suicide. And I think that had I had the means and, the, and an opportunity, I would have acted on those. In some ways, my dysfunction felt very safe, because I had grown a custom of how to work with it, how to live with it. It's a little bit like decorating a jail cell, as though you're going to live there a long time. In fact, I heard that in a message, a sermon at church one time, the pastor was saying, don't decorate your jail cells, and that rung true for me. But it was a dead-end street. I was self-destructing. I'm so grateful that God brought help my way. It started when this friend of mine said, this friend I was in this codependent relationship with, when she said, I can't help you. I'm not going to do this anymore. We're not going to have these long late night sessions where I unpack your day and buoy you up so that you can face tomorrow. We're not going to do that anymore. So the last thing I wanted to hear was the best thing she could have said. Because what it required of me then was to get the help that I needed. I connected with a counselor and a psychiatrist, and it was really out of desperation because I had lost the one faithful support person that I had, that I faithfully attended therapy for a couple years, two years, started medication, and slowly began to get better. What I needed at that point first was forgiveness. I needed to give forgiveness to people who had hurt me. I went through a process talking with my parents about forgiving them for what I did and did not receive in my childhood. I needed to be forgiven for some of the decisions that I had made. And there were some bad ones. I needed a differentiated self. Now, that's a big word, basically, just to say that I needed to know who I was and who I wasn't. How had God wired me? If I could figure that out, then I could begin the process of, re of having dignity restored to my heart. I needed to know that I was valued, not because of what I could do, but simply because of who I was. I needed to develop ways of thinking about the tough things that came my way so that I could respond better, develop what I call sea legs, so that when life throws me a wave, I've got, I can handle it. Now, we're all on that journey. I'm still on that journey, knowing how to handle myself and when tough things come my way. But it was a process of developing specific strategies for me to cope with things like rejection and failure, Disappointment, fear. I needed to know what to do with feelings of anger and frustration and sadness. I needed sea legs. 
here's how I got what I needed. In the process of going through therapy, I came to understand that while I would never have chosen depression, I would never wish it on anybody, I would not trade. I would not trade what I have on this side of it. It was a gift in dark wrapping. When I chose to unwrap it, and essentially there wasn't a lot of other choices, but when I started to dig into it, there were things that I received that I would never have gotten otherwise. I would not have chosen it, but I would not trade what I have on this side of it. My therapist would say things to me like, it won't always be like this. Oh, did I need to hear that? And she would say things like, you're doing the right things. Keep doing the right things. She was saying things like, the future could be different that I was doing what I could do. She was challenging me to take the long view of what life was gonna be like. I sum it up by saying she was one who stood at the crossroads in my life and held a candle of hope. In fact, she said, I will hold the candle of hope for you. And my mom said, I will loan you my faith when you don't have any. Those were words of gold to me. I needed to feel that I was wanted. I had a friend who told me one time that there's this terrific little detail in Mark chapter 3 where Jesus called to himself those whom he wanted. And I camped on that little phrase, and I still, to this day, camp on that little phrase. Jesus called those whom he wanted. He wanted me. And while I love being used of God, and that's a really great thing, when it comes right down to it, I'd much rather be wanted than used. Psalm 8, who am I that you look upon me? Who am I that you have made me a little lower than the angels? Who am I that you have given me dignity? Who am I that you call me a daughter of God? Who am I that I am loved and adopted and gifted? Who am I? I remember one day in particular, it was probably the, the, in the worst season, and I was feeling all of these things, and I needed to do what I call, I need to go in there. <laughs> I need to go in there. So I called a friend, and I um, told her. I said, I'm going in. I'm going into the dark. If you don't hear from me in two hours, you better come over, because something bad will have happened. So I locked myself in the bathroom, and I, uh, I dealt with God, asked him the hard questions. And one question that God asked back to me was, if you fall into the abyss, who's going to catch you? And I literally felt like I was standing on the edge of the abyss looking past my toes, and I wondered, if I fall, who's going to catch me? Wasn't going to be my parents, wasn't going to be my therapist, wasn't going to be my friend, wasn't going to be my boss, wasn't going to be what I could do, wasn't going to be me, who was going to catch me? I love this picture because it was God saying to me, in my mind it kind of looked like this, I'll catch you. And I realized that day the only arms that are big enough to catch me should I fall into the abyss or, or the arms of God? They're the only arms that are big enough. A couple hours passed that night and I came out of the bathroom, called my friend, I said, it's okay, we're good. I needed to deal with it. I needed to know for myself who would catch me. Now I know that in a crowd this size there are some of you who are resonating from your own experience with what I'm saying. There are different levels of depression. Everybody goes through sad seasons. That's 
part of life. They can be a day, a two, a week, a month. Things happen and we feel sad. There are more serious types of depression that, ca that are debilitating, cause us to lose interest or pleasure in the things that we typically enjoy. Not sleeping well, not eating right, feeling tired, worthless, guilty, trouble concentrating, missing class, missing work, not wanting to be with people. Those are the more serious types of depression. If this is you, tell somebody. Somebody wants to be there for you to hold the candle of hope. Somebody wants to be the one to say, I'll, I'll stand there with that candle of hope. I'll help you. You're not alone. You are wanted. You are loved. You are so deeply loved. Tell somebody. Maybe you need to get help. We have a fabulous counseling center on campus. You've got, if you live on campus, you have an RD. You've got faculty who care about you. There are staff members who know you, love you. Student life office on the second floor of Kerwood. We're there. Get some help. I could not have gotten through without the help of my therapist. I couldn't have gotten through without faithful friends who stood with me. Get some help. I want you to know that God offers forgiveness for whatever you have done. God offers dignity and hope, wisdom. Don't give up on God. He's not given up on you. If you're sitting in this room and you think you know somebody who's experienced depression or, is who, or who's in that place, I would ask you to withhold judgment. They probably didn't choose it. I would say know your limits. I've been at this work long enough to know that there are stories of students who have slept in front of dorm room doors so that their roommate would not walk out and get in a car and drive into a tree. Know your limits. If you are sacrificing so much for the emotional well-being of somebody else, you're in too deep. Help your friend get the help that they need. Know your limits. Do what you can. You can pray. You can listen. You can redirect people to the best helpers. You can be a friend. Take your friend to the movies. Sit with them in the DC. Take them for coffee. In general, to everybody, I would say, understand your debris. What do you bring with you from your past? Embrace forgiveness, the giving of it and the receiving of it. Be courageous to address dysfunction. Life is hard, but God is so good. Here's what I know. I know that God's arms are big enough. That's the power. I know that we are wanted. That's the love. And I know that there is a better future. That's the hope. Dr. Schoschberger is going to lead us in the benediction.